Well, how are you? I'm I'm good. I'm good and excited that we're we're back to um, we're back to doing live. So we've had a little bit of a pause over over the summer, and um, really excited to uh, to be going again and to be kicking off with with you. So for for those that that don't know who we are, I'm Raki, and I put together the the blogs and the courses on movement for modern life and and Adam is 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 one of my teachers. So I'm particularly excited to be discussing um, what's going to be a really interesting um, topic, I think, um, tonight. But but Adam, I think you're one of the uh, the most popular teachers on the site as well. And I think people have been really looking forward to, to um, delving into uh, some of this stuff with you this evening. And I, I think you've got some some new classes coming out as well. So I think people have been uh, have been dipping their toe um, into those as as well. So I think we've got absolutely tons to talk about. So um, so I'm going to kick off by uh, asking you what I think is a really simple question. It'll take you no time at all to answer <laughs> it. So we get well. Uh, the general topic for for this evening is taking yoga off the mat and what what that means. So this is something we hear a lot about in yoga circles, but we we sometimes we don't really define that. And it's um, yoga is so multifaceted. So I'm going to ask you what yoga is so what is yoga how how do you define yoga so th thank you for that like softball question of of what is yoga but i think it is important if we're talking about how we bring yoga off the mat that we understand what we're actually doing on the mat and how that fits into a larger context of of, of what yoga is and what is meant uh, in a variety of spiritual traditions with a variety of different types of practices. So defining terms is always important. Uh, and it's hard to define what yoga is because it, it's sort of this all purpose word that has meant uh, many different things in many different texts, in many different traditions for uh, a lot of years. Uh, and, you know, we hear the common definition that it, it's it's to yoke, uh, and it comes from that term uh, within Sanskrit that means you know, you're you're yoking the 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 horse to the the chariot. You know you're 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 yoking the mind to the body. You are uniting two things that maybe it's sort of tough to bring together. Um, and sometimes in the text, that's all they're talking about is like a technique of bringing things together. Uh, or they're talking about a larger set of practices. So we got sort of got to dig into that. But I think it's important to recognize that historically, um, yoga has been a part of and influenced and inspired lots of different traditions. Uh, so they're all the Vedic traditions, they're all the Hindu traditions, they're all the Buddhist traditions, they're all the Jain traditions, they're all the Shramana and other things brewing in India. Uh, and then later on, as, as some of this encountered the West, um, uh, it's inspired and influenced transcendentalists. So like we're talking about Thoreau and Emerson and like uh, Walden and all of that stuff. Uh, and it met all the new age movements of the 60s. So there, there's a lot of different things that yoga means at different points of time. So that, that's a large ramble that sort of sets the context that it, it's hard to pin down what yoga is. Um, you could think about it as techniques uh, for training, disciplining, controlling sort of body-mind. It would be a very sort of scholarly way of looking at it as it, as it sits within different contexts. It's just techniques we use to train body or mind, but not just to train them, to train them on the path of um, like personal spiritual development. And that's sort of broad because it, you have to see that it's slightly different in different contexts for different spiritual traditions. Uh, you know, it'll be very different for a Buddhist than it would be for, uh, you know, uh, 
someone uh, following a new age guru in, in like a 1975 California you know, hotel room uh, or, you know, conference room. So there's, there's, there's all of that. There's just techniques. But I quite like um, uh, Geir uh, Furstein, Furstein uh, who's a, a sort of eminent late scholar on yoga. Uh, he called it psycho-spiritual technology, which I quite like, because it means something that you, 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 you got to do something with it. You got to use it. You got to work with it. Um, but it, it's, you're working towards something. It's usually involving the human tradition. Uh, it, you know, it's, he also refers to it as like liberation teaching, liberation from our suffering, liberation from um, like a narrow, distorted view of the world, like a limited view of the world, um, uh, liberation from this idea that we're separate from everyone and everything. So all this stuff that causes lots of suffering. So, so I quite like this, this psycho-spiritual technology. So I'm sort of, sort of in, into that definition, but there are loads of definitions. And then the problem is that once you sort of get an idea that, okay, it's, it's technique, techniques you use, then you realize there are a lot of techniques of yoga and they're all yoga. So there is what we refer to usually as classical yoga uh, or Raja yoga, which is like essentially meditation. Um, there is Hatha yoga, which is asana, which is posture, which is, um, there was a tradition or there is a tradition of it that dates back um, many hundreds of years, not thousands of years, many hundreds of years of, of Hatha yoga, uh, which inspired our contemporary postural yoga, um, but it's not like, a direct line, but it's related. Uh, there is just the yoga of study and discernment. So like the like the bookworm yoga of, of studying things and studying the nature of things. Um, there's the yoga of devotion. So this is a lot of the devotion to deities and, and praise. Um, there is yoga of service. There is Tantra yoga where you get into subtle energetics and, and lots of things are very hard to explain. Uh, it's Mantra yoga where you're working with sound and like it, there's so much, there's so much yoga. So we, it's, it's very hard to say like, this is authentic yoga. I'm doing authentic yoga because it's, it's a big old tent. Uh, and I find that really exciting. But if you want to think like, all right, am I doing yoga? If you are doing something that is helping you work with your human condition, inspired by these spiritual traditions, these physical traditions, I think you're doing yoga. If you're just working on handstand because you want to take a good photo of it, you're not doing yoga and that ain't going to help you. It might be fun and you might enjoy it for a while, but um, I don't think it's yoga. But, you know, but who am I to say? You know, I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to figure it out. And I quite like that feeling that within yoga, or this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently, is that yoga is both the means and the end. So I quite like that, you, you know, that it's almost a, that when you talk about liberation, it's almost that you can be in a state of yoga. But you, you do yoga to get to that so, state, yeah. of, uh, So which, which I quite find. I don't know if... Um, if the people, um, the movers listening, um, have have their own favorite definitions of yoga or, or, or any thoughts about what what yoga is, because I, I, th I think it's quite slippery to, to define. So if anyone has any favorite thoughts about this, they can, um, they can type that into the, the comment box and we'd, we'd love to, to hear those and, and share those as well. I think Pauline said that she, she likes the idea of lock yoga as liberation and that is um that that's actually found in in quite a lot of the definitions and within the techniques of of yoga that that is often a a, a goal of yoga is is that sense of yoga is is liberation um isn't it that that sense that it's pretty fundamental that it it is liberation teaching and as i said like liberation can also mean many things so it can just you know for me it's just from suffering 
from 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 you know all the, the pain and heartache that suffering causes it's trying to find a way out of that and i believe there is a way out of that it may take a good long time but it there there is a way and so um you you mentioned that the the practice on the mats so asana practice is 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 one of the the techniques of um of yoga and and i think we often talk about yoga on and off the mat as though they are it, it, that's it those it's a binary choice it's yoga on the mat or or yoga off the mat but 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 what you've just said um explores yoga or, or, or defines yoga as something a, a lot more complex. But but just thinking about yoga off the mat, and we'll come back to yoga on the mat because I know you've got quite a few thoughts on on the role of that as well. But I think we, we've almost got to a place now where sometimes yoga off the mat is almost um, put above yoga on the mat as though yoga on the mat is it is something that is maybe not as uh refined perhaps what what's what's your take on yoga on and off the mat and and, and what on earth does yoga off the mat mean <laughs> anyway to you uh, i think we have to look at at yoga off the mat uh in sort of two ways um, the first would be like on the personal level like a how doing whatever you do for your yoga practice. And it's important, it's really vitally important to recognize there are many forms of yoga because there are many different personalities of people, very different needs of people, life situations of people. So that's why there are different techniques because we're all in different places of our lives and we need different things. And if you're listening to this, you are probably a person who values Hatha yoga, but that doesn't mean that like other forms are bad and people who are just pure meditators shouldn't be thinking like people who do hatha yoga are like silly just people wanting to do handstands all day like let's not get into this hierarchy of what is good or not good yoga it's, as i said it's a big tent there are lots of different forms but anyway that's a sidetrack um so as i said it's important to look at yoga off the mat at the personal level uh and then societal level so personal it's like all right so i'm going to do this stuff on the mat is it going to make my life feel a little bit better it's going to help me be liberated from my bad patterns and negative behaviors and self-destruction and you know problems with um you know relationships you know whatever they may be uh is is the stuff that i do on the mat helping me out uh, and i think it's important that in all forms of yoga I, we, we gotta like have the time for practice so like you gotta do some work often by yourself it might be sitting and meditating it might be doing a yoga practice but you, you got to do the work there and um lisa san filippo so one of the movement for modern life teachers was one of my teachers when i first came to london and i always i may have like like recreated it in my head and my fantasies but i remember her saying that your yoga mat is a laboratory and i always like that that image that I am using this time on the mat to help me feel what I need to feel, to process, to work through, to learn about my body, to learn about my patterns, to learn about when I get frustrated, to when I get flustered, when I can't breathe anymore. So I'm using this time to, to work that out for myself. Uh, and you know, the time on the mat has is its own value and, and own benefit, but I think it's important that we do this so we can go back out and relate with others and relate with the world. Uh, so, you know, I, it's, it's really important, the personal level. And like, if you've practiced yoga long enough, and I've been doing this 20 odd years, like you, yoga accompanies you through all sorts of ups and downs. And, you know, there's been times in my life where I've been in like the deepest grief, and pain and heartache. And I look at the mat and I think, what is, what am I gonna do pigeon pose for? Or what am I gonna do? Like, what is just another sun salute gonna do for me? And that's that's when it when when your relationship to your yoga practice gets really interesting because you have to query and figure out 
is all this stuff that I'm doing on the mat that people have told me is good for me. Is it giving me the benefit for my personal life and my like immediate relationships that I think it is? Uh, and what do I actually need to do to, to accomplish that very sort of vital need in my life to, to feel good in my body and to feel healthy in my relationships? And I, and I think we can talk about all the ways I think it works, but I think you can use your time on the mat as a way to be prepared and be conscious and present for your life off the mat. And I don't look at yoga and yoga asana as like some cheap way of doing it or some silly thing. I think we can we can experience a lot of profound um, you know realizations and and changes by just being in our bodies um, and and going through all the provocation of all these difficult shapes and movements and and seeing where it takes us. It's not the only thing we should be doing, but I think it, it's it, it's a, a good teacher. And it, it really teaches us about ourselves, doesn't it? So that 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 um, that instruction about self inquiry, I think, really comes. To, well, it 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 does for me and did for me that I suddenly had this realization that actually I began to understand how I react and respond to things by the way I reacted and responded to them on on the mat. So I. I, I knew when I was shirking away from something that was challenging that I could probably do, but, you know, didn't want to have a go. And and then you can really apply that and see. So it, it's a little bit of a, a microcosm in a, in a way that you can apply to the rest of your life. In fact, Millie said that she finds that the values we bring to yoga on the mat, like compassion towards ourselves, mm. creating a sense of freedom and space, can be brought to lots of aspects of our lives and and yeah beautiful absolutely so there i mean there's so much that we can do for our individual lives and like immediate relationships but you know may, maybe it's like like the sort of naive idealist in me but i i think it does make an, a difference in trying to build an enlightened society so just to give you some some background on myself you know in uh, graduate school, like I spent a lot of time studying public policy and politics and activism and social justice and meeting with all these incredible people around the world working in their communities to affect change. Um, and you know, a lot of that was incredibly positive and inspirational, but like the nuts and bolts of it and, and working with politicians and working with activists, I saw from my experience and my sensitivity, uh, a lot of unprocessed anger and fear. Uh, and we can just see this if we watch the news, that there's a heck of a lot of prejudice uh, and you know, like really divisive behavior in people who are emotionally reactive. Uh, and that causes a lot of the distress. Or is one of the conditions that causes a lot of the pain and suffering around the world is people's lack of self-awareness and knowledge uh, and being able to, to look through the illusion that we're like separate from each other and that one person's needs should matter more than another. Uh, and to me, a lot of the fundamental teachings of yoga and even you know just down dog yoga in a class with other people is, is learning to be compassionate, learning to be aware, learning to be present, learning to be still, learning to, pause and be reflective and all the things that I think are the conditions that are necessary to be an engaged citizen. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, on one level, it's like the pre-political sphere. Like if you want to be active and engaged with your world, I think it is important that you sort out yourself a little bit first and be able to see things clearly and to hear people clearly and to look at a situation and not just look at it through the lens of uh, how, how your emotions tell you to respond to it or how a history of something has to told you to respond to it that you learn to see clearly. And I think that's one of the things that where we learn. Um, so it's the pre-political stuff, but I also think it's what accompanies political engagement or you know just just compassionate engagement with the rest of the world is are these practices uh, so I think it's 
it, it's necessary that we, as if we want to be engaged citizens, kind, compassionate citizens, that we do continual inquiry, self-inquiry, and some sort of practice of yoga within some sort of context of, of philosophy, spirituality, or, or whatever is going to be meaningful to you. And just um, I wanted to ask you a couple of, of things there, really, um, because uh, I've noticed there seems to be um, a little bit of a, a debate um, going on um, within within yeah yoga circles, yoga practitioners, as to whether yoga is a practice, is a personal practice about personal um, spiritual enlightenment and awakening or is it a more a practice about a community is it, it it should social justice and yoga be brought together you've you've already mentioned um thinking about uh the, the, how the political is is affected by the individual absolutely so um so i was just going to throw open the questions of does yoga have a place in in public life does yoga it, it is yoga and do yoga and politics mix is should yoga and social justice should those words be uttered in the same sentence um so this is you know this is where it gets complicated and interesting for me um looking at you know perhaps you know first from a buddhist perspective there there are buddhist paths where you are working on your own individual liberation first. Um, so again, that you can see clearly that that you are out of your suffering and reactivity and and you know things that make you act out. Um, I think that's that, that's like part of the path to get out of your own sense of suffering. Um, or like. It's important to acknowledge that I, not everyone will be able to get out of suffering, especially if it's caused socially. Um, but you 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 learn to interact with your situation, whatever it may be. Um, but like the next level of that is that it becomes about working for an enlightened society, and that you know becomes some of the teachings uh, of, of of Buddhism as it grows and 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 um, and morphs through the centuries. That it's about the awakened, the enlightened society of people together, because one of the underlying beliefs is that we're not separate from others, that we are in this together. And that that goes across many different uh, spiritual traditions from India, that we are not separate. And that is the illusion that causes us suffering which causes us war and, and, and economic injustice and so on and so on and so on. But I think it's also important that if we're trying to understand the ills of modern society and the problems facing modern society and how to engage with that, that we're not looking at texts that are old and from a different society. Like I don't want to go to yoga text to look at uh, like sex and gender issues because I'm probably not going to be happy with what I find, uh, or you know to look at economic injustice or social injustice. I want I want I want to look at what people now are are having to say about it. But I think people who come forward publicly and teach should do their personal work of making sure they see clearly, they listen to others, so they're not fundamentalists in their view. Uh, but that's the, is my personal little hang up. And does this belong in the yoga world? Does politics belong in the yoga world? Well, you know, different traditions will be engaged. Others will be hermits saying like, I'm out of here. This world's screwed up. I'm going to go live up in a cave and I'm going to work on myself. And that's part of it too. So we got to look clearly at a lot of these traditions that some of them say like, you better go to war or, you know, get out of here, go up and live in a cave or go out in the world. Your job is to work with other people. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a big tent. So you guys are like to figure out what you resonate with. And I don't want to say like, 
don't be political. Like if you're a yoga, don't be political because that's not yoga. <laughs> yoga is like so much. But I think you guys start with yourself first and then make sure the practices support you on your journey of engagement. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I was um I was brought up in a in a uh, Hindu family, so um and and one of the um major spiritual texts is, is is the Gita, which is all about engagement and social engagement and having to go out and do something. And I think historically it was at a time um when I, when when a lot of people were going off to live in caves. So um you know it was <laughs> and sometimes I feel like doing that as well. I think cave would be so good <laughs> quickly in twenty twenty. That's just you know. well, the habit we've been doing it anyway. Well, we have, like, we have. Which turned us all into her reflective hermits. A, a cave with 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 Zoom and Facebook. Yeah. Um but but you know I think that 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 text is very much about go out and do some, make society better even even when it's really hard and I think that really is about having to do something you don't want to do because because it's hard and you probably really don't want to do it but there is a need sometimes to to take action you can't just always hide away in the in the in the cave um unless you're hiding away from coronavirus of course um but 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 yeah so i i i absolutely um i th i think uh, i agree with you that <laughs> there is a place for for politics and taking action and uh, but as you say it is also um it's not one thing is it and um sometimes it's appropriate to go and be in a cave and sometimes that's not what's needed um yeah. i as i've been you know watching many people in the yoga world become a little bit more politically engaged lately or feel like they have a responsibility to um the the teaching i came to um is sort of this like the three parts three part teaching of wh what the process is when you encounter uh something new that 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 maybe it's a little unsettling so let's say you know like the black lives matter movement for many people um that was startling information for many people that was like of course of course haven't you seen this <laughs> why haven't you seen this happening um but you know if that is new or or it's new to you to think about how something as as powerful and necessary and and important to deal with as that is how that is how that can be part of your life and your process and your politics um the three-part process that I think is important is learn, contemplate, meditate. And by learn, I mean, you listen, you read, you ask questions, you query yourself, and you take in all that information and you take in not just like little nuggets, you, you dig in, you take the time. This is not a quick process. You take the time, you learn, and then you contemplate. You work through it sort of mentally you ask the deeper questions of yourself and sort of see where, where you might need a shift, where you might need to do something, where you have power. Uh, so, you know, this, again, not a quick process because all of this stuff, you know, this is about not just what we do when we see a bad news story. This is about how we live the whole course of our life. Uh, and then there's the meditate, which doesn't mean you just go sit in your room and meditate. It means that you bring it into your being and the way you live your life and every thought and every action. So you, you allow this to be a, a, a journey of learning. Uh, and of course there are things that need immediate response, but I think we still have to, to sort of see this process in action that we learn, we contemplate, we meditate, we engage with, we bring into our life. And I think that's just kind of reminded me of a couple of other things you've you've said so so two things that i think are are probably fundamental to really understanding what yoga off the mat is as well um because yes it is partially i think for me about applying what you learn but i think that you said earlier on it's about a practice and and that's the point isn't it and we we don't stop yoga the minute we step off our mats but 
but we practice it off our mats as well as on our mats. Um, but you've also said that it's not a quick process. And I think recently I've just really come to realize that um, having done yoga for, for, for 25 plus years that it isn't a quick but but suddenly you sort of realize having done it for, for a long time you suddenly think oh but things are different I react differently to how I may have done once and and, and you know that might just be as you get older maybe you do get a little yeah, bit you, wiser. you have you have aged in 25 years <laughs> yeah so maybe you are a little bit wiser but maybe something else has shifted in that and that is probably the effects of practice isn't it and so um so what might bring you to to doing yoga the first time ever may be different and actually by, by building on that you you learn things that you you don't think you were initially going to learn so you might have been spending 25 years trying to do a handstand but in fact what you've learned are lots of different things and that's why it's not a quick process it's also not a it's not always linear is it either um yoga it's no, no. um it's it's yeah um there's something else i really wanted to um to to talk to you about really was that um which you've you've touched on really but i i, I was going to ask you for another definition um because there's a, a word I think we hear about a lot more, and I think this is also goes to the the root of taking yoga off the mat, and that's that's really about embodiment. So I think this is again a term people love to talk about. You know, yoga is an embodied practice, or it's all about embodiment. So, what on earth? does that mean yeah. in, in so, terms of taking yoga off the mat? So we, I mean, we have one camp of people who's, who get really into saying like, yoga is an embodied practice. Uh, and then you have another camp of people saying like, yoga is not just a physical practice. Uh, and you're wondering like, Whoa, what does that mean? Uh, so for me, embodiment is about understanding that there is no real separation between the body and the mind, that many of us may not like consciously believe we think this, but like act as if we have a head that controls everything and the body just walks it around and, and like feeds us. But all the stuff is happening up here. Uh, when in reality, there is so much communication happening from the body from the gut, from the limbs, back and forth. And we, so much of our nervous system is in our tissues, is in our skin, is in our muscles, is in our belly. Um, so the idea of embodiment to me is recognizing the reality that so much of what we feel and experience in our life is experienced through neck down. But yet we get really fixated on just mind and there's a lot of yoga teaching that gets really like into just what's going on in the mind and doesn't get so much into the body so postural yoga hatha yoga asana the stuff that we do is a way for me of getting into our embodiment feeling our bodies and forming a relationship with our bodies because in the context of our of our society Many of us have adversarial relationships with our bodies because we believe it should be younger or skinnier or more flexible or stronger or, you know, a, a different skin tone, you know, whatever it may be, um, that the relationship with the body is pained. And I think it's important to heal that as a, as part of our liberation, liberation from suffering. So asana hatha yoga postures to me is part of that embodiment and uh, to even get more technical it's just training yourself to feel the sin actual sensations of your body from the inside out not from the outside in 
from the inside out, feeling the sensations of your body. So em embodiment is vital to me, absolutely vital. So we've got, um, just wanted to catch up with a couple of comments. So um, I think Vera says, but for me, the most powerful and meaningful philosophy yoga has taught me is a simple but very difficult teaching is to let it go. Um, and and we, we've got some people that, that really um, resonates with. Um, and then we've got a comment from um, Pauline that it's a separateness or the illusion of separateness from others that causes conflict. Um, and um, and Fiona saying it took four years before yoga f followed her off the mat. Those, so. are, those, those are good numbers. That's not yep. so bad. That's pretty good. <laughs> can, I, can I say one thing about what Vera said? Because I think yeah. it, it's interesting. Um, let it go. You know, we have our like, little like Elsa Frozen yes. sing along. <laughs> we can get rid of I'm, but... I'm picturing Vera skating <laughs> on the ice currently. <laughs> there are so many things that are just products of our neurosis that we can let go and and the process of learning to see clearly um which we could we'll, we'll get i want to get you some of the like the practicalities of what i think happens on the mat in a second but the process of learning to see things clearly and to feel things embodied there are many things that we can learn yeah to let go because we realize that ain't reality that you know that is just me being neurotic that's about patterns that are 20 odd years old i can i can let that go and live free, liberated, and happy. So like, by all means, work with that, sing that song in your head when you spot those things and you can let it go, let it go. And I hope that doing asana teaches you to, to like bust those things and feel that. But then there's another level of that um, and I'm sure some people will think, well, I can't let go of the fact that this person I love died. I can't let go of the fact that I have this illness that's not going to go away and maybe it's going to kill me or it's going to kill my partner. I can't let go of the fact that, you know, I can't walk the way I used to. Um, and I think that is fine. We don't let it go. And we, we free ourselves of the pressure from ourselves and from our teachers and pop culture to saying, I need to let that go. And we say, all right, I don't let it go. I befriend it. I form a new relationship with it that is friendly uh, and that we come to terms about how we can live together. Uh, and I think, again, that's something we can learn through meditation. I think that's something we can begin to learn through awesome when things are unpleasant, when things are tough, when things are unchangeable, how do we move forward? And some of that's the underlying attitude of compassion, which I've talked about before, but some of that is just encountering those things. And well, if it's our real life, we might encounter it in meditation. If it's you know just a tough thing, we can sort of create that situation in an asana class. But there are some things we cannot let go of, and that's okay. And that's absolutely okay. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I, th I, I think I was just going to, to, to follow that by saying that there's, um, there's that prayer, isn't there, about recognizing the, the, changing things that oh, the serenity that prayer yeah. about the serenity prayer and then recognizing when <laughs> it's a great you know, prayer yeah, it's a great yeah prayer. absolutely and, and and then sometimes you do have to as you said if there is grief over the loss of someone then then that you know that in this life that person is not going to pop up again and, and there is grief and and as you said it's it is learning the process of of living with with that the um and and that's that's the skill as well that's the maybe the skill in action um but the good know. like the good news is that like how human is that that is grief and how many people have suffered that i mean there's there's the, the sort of famous 
um, Buddhist teaching, which I'll screw up now, but you know, the, the, you're the woman who has lost her child or husband or what, you know, what name the grief goes to the, the Buddhist teacher and says, you know, can you help me, you know, let go of the suffering. And he says, all right, go to every, you know, every hut, every family in this village that has, has suffered grief and get the little a mustard seed or something and bring it to me. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll, we'll create, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that will help you be free of the suffering. So she goes and then sees, wait, I'm not alone in this. Everyone has experienced this. And, and then, you know, you, then, then you can move forward. You know, you're not alone. And it's human. We all go through it. We, we, we can, we can get out of the suffering. And so in terms of, of understanding practically then what it means to practice our yoga off the mat, is it, is it that? Is it learning to be at peace with being human? I mean, that's, oh, well, that sounds like a great goal, but I think we can, we can do a lot on the mat that affects our life off the mat and teaches us great lessons. So I think, which has already been brought up in the chat, like big lesson number one is self-compassion. And to me, that is not simply starting your practice by saying, today I'm gonna be compassionate towards myself and bowing and then you, know, you go do your yoga practice. That to me is not using your time on the mat to learn that skill. It's not embodying it. Like all this stuff is good and great, uh, but we got to get it in our bodies. So for me, learning self-compassion would be like how you touch your body, how you move in certain ways, how you proceed if it's tough for you to go into a flexibility shape how you back off if you know like this ain't gonna this ain't gonna be good uh so i think you, you can learn self-compassion uh in a really embodied way so that is like number one um the, like the underlying attitude then of course breathing just learning to breathe and move and especially in tough shapes is enormously valuable because many of us do not breathe well in our normal lives uh, and we're not aware of how we breathe in our normal lives. And we're not aware how that breath manipulates our nervous system. So for example, if you're a person, when you get stressed and you breathe really quickly and really high in your body, that's gonna make you feel more stressed and it's gonna escalate whatever situation of stress you're in to where it feels like life or death. And then you're probably gonna get emotionally reactive and yell at someone. They're gonna yell back at you. And then it's just gonna go on and on and on and on. I'm sure you have had that happen to you in your life and you know that feeling. But if you know that, all right, when I get stressed and maybe I've seen this happen on the mat, I start breathing quickly and I start breathing high. And I know, cause I've learned it on the mat that if I slow my breath and I'm bringing it a little bit deeper into my ribs and my belly, that's gonna slow my breath down and it's gonna manipulate my nervous system into a calmer state. So not everything is perceived as a threat and I'll be able to see whatever's happening. Even if it's a stressful, crappy event and someone's yelling at you, if you can calm yourself down, then you can respond in a different way that hopefully won't escalate a situation. Uh, so that's like, like so easy to do, um, not always easy to do like in the event, but you know, it's, it's, it's easy to work on and to know that you can work on. Uh, and it's also helps you see that, all right, maybe I overreacted in that situation. How was my breathing? Or I, I, I'm witnessing myself overreact. Can I pause for a second and take a few deep breaths and see if anything shifts? So like learning the breath through something challenging as we do in an asana class is so vital to living your life well and, and, and free of like escalating suffering. Uh, then there's also, as I've said like many times, learning to see things clearly and see the reality. Uh, and 
because many of us just feel like we have brains that are being led around by like a dumb body, um, we don't feel things clearly because we don't understand what's actually being felt in our body. We don't understand that emotions and anxiety and pain and suffering is often experienced physically in the body with physical symptoms. So for example, anxiety might be experienced by an escalated heart rate or a feeling of like closing in on the chest and the heart. And that's a you know, common symptom of anxiety. Um, and you might experience that through challenges presented in a yoga class and then you learn the techniques of managing that or being with that or slowing that down or you know the techniques that will take you in the opposite direction and maybe you, you put your legs up and you can lower your heart rate or you put an eye bag on or you do any of the things that you know can lower your heart rate so we can learn a lot about seeing clearly feeling clearly through our embodiment through the asana that we do if it's taught well and, and um, practice well. Uh, as you've mentioned, like just learning resilience through challenges. Like if you are doing something tough and you give up on the yoga mat, it's, it's highly likely that that might be the attitude you have about a lot of other challenges in your life. Uh, and you know, it, maybe it shows up really explicitly and clearly in a yoga class but it's very like super subtle in your life but you you, know, you can sort of like learn to, to experience those things um other things for me like one of the things i taught on on uh the series of classes uh, that are coming out now uh is patience so i know i'm often impatient well like all right well how can i embody patience so i started thinking about the speed uh at which i do my sun salutations and can I insert a pause in my breath as I do my sun salute, as I slow down? I'm trying to slow myself down as I talk now and be patient in, in delivering this knowledge to you. Um, so I can learn patience on the mat and that can teach me about what patience feels like in my body so i have a taste of that what what does it trigger in me when i'm forcing myself to be patient which meaning it means i'm encountering my own impatience to want to like move and get on with it but if i take the time to feel in my body what patience feels like and also by extension what impatience feels like i can bring that into my life uh and then there's like all this like dealing with complexity so all these big old complicated arm balances that I work on a lot, like this ain't a life skill. Doing an arm balance is not going to make you a happier person by just doing an arm balance. They're fun. I enjoy them. I enjoy the process. But I think it's really about learning something difficult, but also learning something complex and learning the patience and process to work with that complexity. Um, another one like that was in the, the course I'm working on is enthusiasm and exertion like when i'm low and don't want to do something and i need to do something or i need to get out of bed or i need to get out of the house what can i do to get that energy up without you know, like freebasing uh, espresso how can i get up how can i get you know motivated to do what i need to do and i like i encounter that all the time especially when i'm trying to do a morning practice like all the like the morning classes i filmed for you guys it's usually starting with me like moaning about how i never want to do anything in the morning and just stretching on the ground but that's the process of like willing myself uh slowly uh into action and then you know there's like loads and loads more we can work on but i think it's also important that in especially in deep rest and deeper meditation, there can be, you You might find that you receive insights, this might sound a little airy, but like insights into the nature of your mind, the nature of reality, the nature of your consciousness. If you go deep enough into something like Shavasana or restorative shape or, or spend enough time meditating regularly, you start experiencing reality in a different way. Uh, and that's that's the long-term practitioner thing. 
like if you spend enough time observing your mind and being in your body, you see that things aren't the way you thought they were. And that's really interesting. Uh, and then that changes the way you interact with the world. So, I mean, there's like, so much, so much you can learn on the mat. So I, I get, as I said before, I get frustrated when people say like, it's not just the physical, but like, yoga isn't just the physical. To me, it's all the physical, but it's like, you got to really do the physical and inhabit the physical and be embodied and, and, and go through all these challenges in life and see, see how it exists within your embodiment. That was a long ramble. Sorry for making it. <laughs> that's, to all that. No, that's uh, that's great, and um, and and I was grinning away because I think I'm, I'm possibly the least patient person there is. Oh, good. Thinking, well, my class is coming out soon. I, I was just thinking, yeah, I think I need to possibly make, have that one on on daily repeat. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, that's that's a skill I I definitely need to to work on. Um, I was just just going to say to um, to the people watching, if you have any questions or or thoughts about how you take yoga off the mat or what what it means to you, then um, then this is a great time to 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 type type them in and and um, and ask about practical ways of of doing that um, as as well um so so if anyone has any questions then um please um please do ask um so um i think i think i i don't have i think I, well yeah actually i do have one one last question um for you and i think we've touched on it with us kind of we've talked about a length of practice and and doing like yoga over a long period of time and how it, it in fact that that really shifts your understanding and your relationship to um what yoga off off the mat um means but uh, i was just interested to to ask you as well a little bit about your own um your own understanding and how how that developed did did you come to to the mat did you first come to your first yoga class thinking I'm here for spiritual enlightenment and to learn how to be human. I was 18 years old. I wanted to be flexible. I wanted to be skinny. I probably wanted to get a date. Like it doesn't always start profound, um, but like if you stick with it long enough, you realize that like, there's there's a, so much more. And I think what happens is after a few years, like the the initial charm, the initial love affair, <laughs> like it, it, it fades away. And then you sort of, you see that there's, there's, there's so much more depth and complexity and things to explore, but you got to find the right type of yoga for you. So like, we're, we're probably talking to the converted, the people who like Hatha yoga. So we don't need to convince or like defend this. We, we know this has value and we know this has meaning, but, keep questioning if 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 it is doing what you think it's doing for you uh, or you're, if you're just like expecting something to happen that you've been told is going to happen because uh, it ain't going to happen like no one's going to help you but you so you you are in charge of this process uh, you know and I've gone as I said a long road through this it's accompanied me through you know friends dying father dying, marriages, uh, job changes, I, I, all sorts of things. It's there for you. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you need a break. Sometimes you need to rethink your whole relationship to it. But I, I really, I really like firmly believe that it, it holds value. And I, I just want to like, um, I see some questions are coming in, so we'll, we'll come to that in a second. But I want to like make sure you have some practical things like so we're all doing you know in these movement from our live classes we're trying our best to give you tools that help you affect your personal life uh and and many of us are also giving you tools we think helps us build an enlightened society and, and how we work with each other uh, but do know that there is there are so many uh from different traditions sort of like 
ethical codes you can follow or be inspired by or help you see a framework of how you can use these teachings to to sort of free yourself from suffering and also work towards a better world so you know clearly there are like the which i think you know, it's video doing a, a series about the um yeah. the uh the eight limbs of yoga potentially so that that is one you may resonate with that the eight limbs are very 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 like closely related to the uh, the um the noble eightfold path of buddhism so you may resonate with that uh, there's Mimi's doing a course on the Brahma Viharas, which are like the four immeasurable minds coming from the Buddhist teaching. Uh, so you can you can look at that, see if they inspire you. I'm doing the Paramitas, which is this sort of this training and awakened heart. So it's there. Are, there are so many lists. If you're a person who likes lists and things you can work with from the great spiritual traditions of India, there are so many. And of course there are lists and commandments and other spiritual and religious mm -hmm. traditions, and there are completely secular ones. So I like, find what inspires you, but my my like mission and like like little challenge for you is to think about how do I embody that? If I'm if I'm taking that text and that teaching and I really think that like I there's something there. I are you bringing that into the way you move and breathe, and can you? You know, like ahimsa in 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 the Patanjali, they like like you say, I really believe in nonviolence. I'm going to be a pacifist. I'm going to be a vegetarian. But then, are you beating yourself up with like ten thousand chaturangas and being violent to yourself? So just like think about how you can bring all this stuff into your body, uh, into um, what you do on the mat, and then. I bet you'll learn something. So the um, it, the questions from Pauline, how can I get past the I don't want to do this today moment, which sometimes lasts a week? <laughs> I could I could be really annoying and say, well, just wait for my class. Wait, wait a month or so. You could, you could do the enthusiasm class. Um, but traditionally, um, you can think about a teacher that inspires you or a quote that inspires you. So like sometimes on my mat, I'm on my mat thinking of Michelle Obama, thinking like, I can do this. She can do it. I can do it. Um, so you think about a teacher or someone who really inspires you. Okay. It can be a simple thing as, well, let me just open up the window shades. Let me throw some water on myself. Or you can start thinking about, well, what are the things I, you know, I, if I don't want to do that, what do I want to do? And is there something I can do on my mat that will get me started? So if you're like saying, I don't, I don't really want to do that, that 30 minute flow. All I want to do is lie down. Well, go lie down on your mat and then see what happens after five, 10 minutes. And maybe you'll get the itch to, to move. Um, but you know, it's first recognize it's, it's not uncommon to lose enthusiasm and and for your practice um, and that we have ups and downs so sometimes you just got to ride out the down um, but you can you can you can perk yourself up there'll be more in the class and then maybe if it's that you don't want to do it today and I, I I like the do something for five minutes and then if you still don't want to do it maybe you don't want to do it maybe yeah, you do fine. just need to lie down and um, maybe you'll tie I mean maybe there's a reason why yeah. any particular practice isn't isn't right for for that day or um but but it's also about kind of probing and questioning that a little bit and and seeing seeing why but um but i i i often have that moment actually we <laughs> all do we all do which is why i filmed a 45 minute class about it and um but I, I I find that if I put a timer on and say I'm only going to do five minutes and then I that, then I then I want to say no, no, switch the timer off. I want to do more. So um I'm just bloody minded maybe, but um, but I find that just doing a little bit, but I also think that we, we don't have to do daily hour long asana practices i don't wouldn't you agree adam that if maybe sometimes doing 10 minutes of shavasana 20 minutes of shavasana is a great practice um yeah. when we really need to do that or 
five minutes of meditation or I don't know walk in the garden or but it is defining what and maybe it is a little bit about defining what yoga means to you and and how you practice that and if it is about embodiment then it's more than about just doing a set asana practice maybe it's about what your body needs yeah I mean, that opens a larger conversation. So well, maybe we'll, we'll let that be, but just I'm, I'm be, it. Kind, okay. be, be <laughs> kind to yourself and know that it's not um, not an uh, abnormal response to not want to do it. And and yogis and, and you know spiritual teachers have been talking about that for a long time, but there is a process. Yeah. And um, um, Fiona says she's really looking forward to your class next oh, week. Good. But, uh, okay. And then two two are out, aren't they? And we've got we've got a few more to to come in. And then um, through October, we've got um, uh, which I think you you touched on, Adam. We've got a, a course um, inspired by some um, Buddhist teachings, both with classes, both from Mimi and and Adam, and and Adam's going to be doing another live um specifically looking at some of those qualities we've touched on so that's that's coming up we've got some some um exciting blogs from from adam coming up as as well to coincide with that course so um so there's there's lots more to to delve um into coming up but um i think we're we're getting to the end of of our time now adam and did you want us uh, have a a a, a, a a more formal closing. Yeah. So I just wanted to say one brief thing is that yoga has merit and it gives us benefit. And we know this. We know it makes us feel better. And it, we know it creates a positive energy in our bodies and our lives. And that if we hoard that benefit just for ourselves, then we create a situation of suffering because we're doing where then we start creating all the circumstances to like hold on to that positive thing we're doing for ourselves. But if we share it, if we share the merit of practice then suddenly it, what could have caused us suffering now brings joy to others. And it's not something we have to cling to. We can just sort of be free with it. So I think it's important, not only just for like, not creating a situation of suffering and clinging for ourselves but for society that we share the merit of our practice so to do that just briefly or sort of feel that for ourselves i thought it'd be nice if we close with three breaths and the first one we give to ourselves to to feel and have it embody whatever we're experiencing in our lives and need to feel and need to care for. And we do that for ourselves, the first breath. The second breath, we do so to care for someone we know well. So we offer them our kindness. We take in their suffering, we offer them our kindness. And the third one we do for whoever else is out there suffering or in pain that maybe we've seen in a newspaper or uh, in a online news story or we're just sort of imagining so ourself someone we know well and then everyone out there which by the way there's no difference between all of us so sit comfortably first for yourself big breath in and out picture in your mind someone you know well breathe in their suffering Offer your kindness back. And then to all those loads of people out there, breathe it in, take in whatever they're feeling, offer back your kindness, your care. So that to me is just feeling what it's like to take yoga off the mat. So hopefully that inspires you. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank and, you. Um, we're looking forward to lots of amazing stuff from you coming up as well. My Thanks. pleasure. Bye, everyone. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>